Doris Davenport, corresponding broadcaster for Black Muse. Black Muse is where creatives from the worlds of jazz, hip-hop, gospel, politics, sports and fashion, theater and literature engage in the lively art of conversation. I am so pleased to be here today with a young man who in my view and the view of many others is a living legend and a renaissance man if I have ever, ever met one. I'm speaking of none other than Jesse Clark White. He's an American educator, a politician, and a former athlete from the state of Illinois. He's a member of the Democratic Party. He has served as the 37th Secretary of State since 1999. He is the longest serving and the first African American to hold this position. Secretary of State Jesse White, how are you? And welcome to Black Muse. Doris, glad to be on board. It is such a pleasure. I have been wanting to interview you for some time. I have spent many years going into offices, reading um, articles about you, seeing pictures about you, and I want to talk to you about so many things that you've done in your career. Well, let's do it. All right, let's do it. Well. You know, Secretary, first of all, I think let's go way back to your childhood in Alton, Illinois. What was Alton like when you were growing up? Well, Alton was a small town on the Mississippi River across from St. Louis, and, and we lived in an area called Dogtown. <laughs> so whenever it would rain, we'd have to start swimming. <laughs> And we, I stayed there until age seven, mm -hmm. and then we decided to move to Chicago, to the near north side. And we moved <clears throat> into a predominantly Italian neighborhood called Cabrini Green, was later a part of that community. Mm -hmm. But in that a area, we had to kind of learn to cook pisci italiano, <laughs> eat the linguine with the calamari, sauce the bubble, look the pieces, eat the italiano. So we had to. You know, relate mm -hmm. to the people. And it was a great experience for me. I worked for a fellow by the name of Sam Aiello. I learned a lot about groceries. I learned a lot about, you know, getting along with people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that when you come through this world, you become successful, you give back. But every day you must do something good for someone. And then later on, a fellow by the name of George Dunn, who later became the county board president. Mm -hmm. He's the longest serving in the history of this the county of Cook. Uh, well, he uh, put me under his arms and made sure that whenever I would go off to college, uh, that when I come back during the summer, I had a job with a park district because I was a major. I majored in physical education. I attended Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama, and so I worked for the park district. And then, after I had graduated from college, I uh, went out to Wrigley Field to try out for the Chicago Cubs. Now, I want to put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that part of it. I want to back up a little bit, though. Okay. When you were a young man um, e uh, in Chicago, before you got, before George Nunn got a hold of you, sure. what kind of jobs did you have as a young man? Um, or were you a child who just ran the streets and no, got no, into no, trouble? No, 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 no. I, I played. <laughs> I went to, attended Lincoln Park High School, which mm -hmm. is was Waller High School then. I played basketball, played in the band and orchestra and on the baseball team. I was an all-city baseball and basketball player. What instrument did you play? I played drums. Mm -hmm. And then um, after I had graduated from high school, uh, I was scheduled to go to Beloit College, but I didn't have a sequence in math. They turned me down, mm -hmm. Blippon turned me down. Tennessee State said I was too short. <laughs> Northwestern University said that I didn't have a sequence in math, but Alabama State took me. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I played uh, basketball, baseball and I taught gymnastics. And at church, uh, Dr. King, who was my minister, 
indicated that a lady, a domestic worker by the name of Rosa Parks had been arrested and that uh, he had been asked by the city fathers to lead the effort to desegregate the Montgomery Transit System. And he said he had agreed to do so, but he was going to use the nonviolent means approach. After every basketball game, he used to meet me and give me $20. <laughs> that was legal then, not legal now. Okay? That's right, that's right. And so uh, at church, he indicated that he had to undergo this, this task of desegregating the, the Montgomery Transit System. He said he was a student of Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Gandhi was instrumental in bringing about the independence for the Indians from the British. Mm -hmm. And he said he used an unviolent means approach. So if someone strikes you on one cheek, you turn so you get struck on the other cheek. I raised my hand and said, Jesse, well, what can I do for you? I said, Dr. Kate, you know I'm from Chicago <laughs> and we don't operate like that. <laughs> we don't turn the other cheek. <laughs> That's right. So he said, just follow the script. If you do that, everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up uh, graduating from Alabama State and then came back to Chicago. And a fellow by the name of Bill Prince said, uh, who had been following me through my high school and through my college career, mm -hmm. said that uh, the Cubs are having a tryout and uh, you're on the list. He said, uh, can you make sure that I don't end up with egg on my face? I said, okay, fine, I'll go out. Mm -hmm. There were close to 250, maybe 300 ball players. They only took five and I was one of the five. Mm. So and this was the Cubs. It's Cubs, yes. The so, world-renowned Chicago Cubs. Oh, right. So now I'm scheduled to go to spring training the next year. This was 15, 57 was when I graduated. In 58, I was scheduled to go to spring training. Four days before going to spring training, I was drafted into the Army. <sighs> so instead of going to spring training, I'm going to basic training at Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Wow. And while I was there, I got a notice from my college that I had to come back to school to Alabama State to walk across the stage to get my degree. Mm -hmm. So I explained it to my captain and he said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll assist you in the process. So they got me to St. Louis and I caught the element train and ended up in Montgomery, walked across the stage, and now I'm scheduled to fly back to my base. Mm -hmm. I had never flown an airplane before and they sent me out to Maxwell Air Force Base and they said, uh, this is your mode of transportation back to your base. So we take off in a driving rainstorm. We get over Birmingham, Alabama. It's raining like cats mm. and dogs. They had six chutes on the floor. I grabbed one and I put it on, asked the crew chief to assist me to make sure mm -hmm. it was all right, on properly. And he said, uh, I said, aren't you gonna jump? He said, well, no, no, I'm not gonna jump. I'm gonna ride this fella in. <laughs> they pull the door off, mm -hmm. the rain was coming in. And now we were close to we're close to Nashville, mm -hmm. and so the captain said we're going to head westward toward Memphis. And we're around Memphis and head on the northeast pattern to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Oh my God, said, this is like reading said, a thriller. Close the door back, so they close the door, and I'm shaking like a leaf. First time on an airplane, the plane's about to crash. And you're wearing a parachute. And I had a parachute on, but I was and it, it felt the chief was not going to jump, but I was going to jump. <laughs> So we landed at Wright Patterson, and the lieutenant walked up and said, Private White, your flight is ready for Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. I said, Captain, uh, I'm not in any condition to <laughs> fly on another airplane. So he said, okay, fine, um, where's the bus station? <laughs> Good old So Graham. he says, I'm not happy about the fact that we commissioned a special plane for you and you're not gonna take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm in no condition to fly. So I got, got on the bus, ended up at my base. Three, four days later, I'm walking on the base. I see this fellow with this beautiful outfit on, mm -hmm. tailor-made pants, spit shad boots, nice hat. Mm. I said, uh, Sergeant, I said, what do you know you with? He's with the 101st Airport Division. I said, you jump on airplanes, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, how could a person like me become a part of a unit like yours? Mm. He said, well, what do you have to offer to the 101st Airborne Division? I said, well, I'm a college grad. He said, well, we have a lot of college grads. Is mm -hmm. there anything else? I said, I'm a professional baseball player. No, you're not. Don't, don't kid me. <laughs> I said, no, I'm a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. He said, prove to be a professional baseball player. I said, I happen to have my contract in my duffel bag in, the, in my barracks. Mm -hmm. He said, I want to see it. So mm -hmm. I ran got my contract, mm -hmm. came back, mm -hmm. and I showed them sketch. I, I just got that big. Because in the Army, a lot of the teams, a lot of the officers 
bet on the games, mm -hmm. and they bet on the boxing, and they bet on the baseball. Yeah, the yeah. list goes on and on. So I ended up at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, in jump school. Jump school is 13 days, mm. five days of ground training, mm -hmm. but, uh, sorry, 10 days of ground training, mm -hmm. two weeks, and then three days of jumping out of an airplane, two days on Monday, two on Tuesday, and the third day, Wednesday, is your final jump mm -hmm. in order to earn your wings. While I was in jump school, this sergeant walked over to me and said, Private White, every time I ask meet, I want you to give me a gig. And then if I say, give me a double gig, you're going to do 20 push-ups and I'm going to do 10. Mm. I did close to a thousand push-ups at jump school. Oh like my every goodness. Time it, this fellow was on me big time. <laughs> wow. And so the other soldiers were saying, why is he after you? I said, yeah. I don't know. I haven't done anything to him. And sure enough, mm. when I finished my, th my fifth jump, he walked over to me and said, Private White, so you're a hell of a soldier. Mm. I would be honored for you to have dinner with me and my family in Clarksville, Tennessee. Wow. And tears came down my mm. eyes. I just couldn't believe that this mm. guy was on me so tough mm, yes, in jump school, yes, but yet he yes. showed me some love. That's right, that's so right. So I, I spent some time reading about him, mm -hmm. and I would also encourage you to do likewise. Sure. This is Austin Harjo, H-A-R-J-O. H-A-R-J-O, Austin. Austin. Uh -huh. And you'll see what kind of a guy mm -hmm. he was in the military. He received mm. over 100 medals. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So now when I'm tough on my kids, mm -hmm. that is an outgrowth of what was done to me. Mm -hmm. And I have been able to save a lot of young people. I coach a team called Jesse White Tumblers. I've yeah. done that for 64 years. And I've had over 18,500 young people. Mm. And last count, only 15. And someone says, only 15. I said, well, yeah, that's, that's my number right now. Mm -hmm. He said, well, why is it so low? I said, well, I'm a former military person. And the young people know that they'd rather be in trouble with the police than be in trouble with me. Mm -hmm. Now you know the rest of the story. That's right. I said, Every well, kid yeah. can't handle that. That's right. And speaking of handling things, first of all, Austin Harjo, uh, what nationality was he? He's an American Indian. Really? Yeah. Well, that name Harjo just stood out. Yeah. Interesting, an American Indian. Tough. Mm. Tough as nails. You know, I think about our kids today, all the violence we see in the street. As a young, we've changed. The, the world has changed. Sure. We coddle kids today. We give them an easy road. Um, nowadays, Kids look at somebody who's hard on them, and they walk right out the door. They're not going to stand for it five minutes. And that's part of the training. Yeah, but I have kids who want to be a part of what I'm involved with. I have a drum corps. Mm. And the drum members of the well drum corps, known. no problem with them, and no problems with the tumblers, mm -hmm. because they know that if they violate the spirit of the laws or the rules and regulations mm -hmm. that I've established, that there's a price to pay. Mm -hmm. You become persona non grata. They say, well, what is that, Mr. White? <laughs> that means you're out of here. No, I don't want to leave. I want to be a part of it. I've taken these young people all over the world, Zagreb, Croatia, Belize, Israel, China, mm. Tokyo, Japan, Hong Kong, Honolulu, Hawaii, the list goes on and on. We have a list, and then, not to mention uh, all the commercials we've done and all of the places I've taken these young people here in the United States. Big Ten, Major League Baseball, basketball, tennis, soccer. You're more than a coach to them. You're, you're, you're a coaching father. Well, I serve as a safety net that I attend in the tunnel for them. If they have a problem, I want to, I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm there to give them guidance mm -hmm. and also give them discipline if that is required. That's right. And that's what's missing, it's, I think. It's called family. It's called family. These young people have to maintain at least a C average in school. Mm -hmm. They have to be leafless, smokeless, and pipers. The only time they can practice pharmacy is after they wear a white coat. <laughs> they cannot dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color. That's the mm -hmm. ugliest card in the deck. Cannot play that one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they understand that if the grades fall below par, they cannot perform until the grades come up to par. So yeah. we put that carrot out there for them to 
to, to dangle yeah, in their faces yeah. so that they'll know that uh, we mean business. I'm hoping that there is a way, and maybe you've already started working on this, because I want to talk a little bit about the Secretary of State's office and what's under your purview. The librarian for the state. The of library, Illinois. yeah. I have 5,000 libraries that come under my jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and I visit uh, pretty close to 175. Every year? No, not every year, but <laughs> in total. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to visit all of them, but I just could not do so because of my schedule. Yeah. Libraries are so important. They were one of the m one of my favorite places to go to as a kid. Well, it's a safety net that lights in the tunnel for a lot of young people and mm -hmm. adults as well. And then we have yeah. um, the program by which we provide educational opportunities for senior citizens as well. Mm -hmm. And then we provide grants to uh, some of the organizations that spend time touring our senior mm -hmm. citizens. That's it's beautiful. Our, it's our liter literacy program. Yeah. Um, out in Oak Park, yeah. our library there, we had an opportunity about maybe five years ago. We had a big decision to make, the library did. Uh, there was a death. Um, a homeless person was found in one of the bathroom stalls. I think it was an overdose. Um, and a lot of people in the town uh, went up in arms and said, you know, we've got a problem with homelessness and crime and all those little kids, you know, playing outside all the time. We need more security, security, security. The library went inward. And they came back and announced that they would not follow the path of filling the library with more security. Instead, they implemented a whole program of social justice. And the library is now a place that is really open and has a lot of programs for the youth, and particularly the minority youth and the kids that have it's, no other place to go for recreation. Uh, the safety net, but it's also a place where individuals could come become better educated, better informed, and uh, it's also a place where people can come to find shelter, mm -hmm. get advice and counsel. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, our librarians are some of the top people that you find they in society. Are. They really are. Hard is that big. That's right, that's right. We don't award them enough. When you think about your childhood and the childhood that kids are exposed to today, what are the major differences? What is missing for young people today that you had when you were a young person? Well, I was afraid to disappoint my parents. Uh, I went to school because my parents told me that I had to go to school. Mm -hmm. But what, what I, parents I, tell kids I, they have to go I, to school I, today? I, I, that's right, with some kids, you know, they take off. I used to go to school every day. Mm. And I was asked to, and was required to come back home with good grades. Mm -hmm. I was afraid to disappoint my parents. I was afraid to dis disappoint my relatives and my brothers and my sisters because, you know, the white name was there. Mm -hmm. And we always wanted to rise above uh, the rest. Mm -hmm. And every time I've had to embark upon something, I would put my best foot forward. Do you ever think about the breed of a man? I'm a black woman in 2022. When I look at you, eyeball to eyeball, I see a different breed of man than I see coming up today in a lot of ways. Now, don't get me wrong, we've got, I'm so proud of these young men coming out of schools today, really understanding the future that's on their shoulders. But there's a diff, it's the breed. I look at my father, who was a tech sergeant. He was in the Air Force. Um, and he was like you very much. We grew up knowing, knowing, you know, if we got a, if my parents got a phone call from the school, it better not be about one of us being in trouble. And we were all girls. Uh, but I, I know about the ironing cord. I know about the strap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been down that road a few times, a few not times. many, because a few times I had to be just. You learn quick. Uh, the, the the back. Mm -hmm. you know, my, where I sit down, it's, it still aches a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I go back through your career, I think of you, um, and, and I like numbers, you were 16 years as a lawmaker, is that right? 16 years as a state representative. Mm -hmm. In Springfield. Yeah. You spent six years as, uh, as a Cook County Recorder of Deeds. Cook County Recorder of Good Deeds. Of Good Deeds. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And for 21 years, no, how long have you 20, been? 24 years. 24 years as Secretary of State. I'm the longest serving Secretary of State in the history of the state, the longest serving 
in the history of this country. And the first black yeah, man. The first African American, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know people say African American, but I like to say the first black man. Yeah, there's a story behind that, too. Tell me. Well, I was in war committee, but this is the 27th War, and Walter Burnett is my alderman. And um, I was asked by some of the precinct captains to seriously consider running for the Secretary of State. I said, you know, I'm enjoying being the Cook County Recorder of Good Deeds. He said, well, yeah, that's a good <laughs> job, and there's a lot to be said about that position, but uh, there's a bigger picture out there. I said, like, like what? Well, Secretary of State. I said, well, I said, I, you never have a, you've never seen an African American serve mm -hmm. as a secretary say anywhere. Mm -hmm. He said, "Well, we think that you have the tools that are necessary to make that happen." I said, "Well, what do you suggest I do?" These were twelve of my precinct captains. Mm -hmm. He said, "We think you should speak with Speaker Madigan, and Nick, who was the chairman of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and the speaker and the Speaker of the House." Mm -hmm. So I called him, and I, my office was three blocks away on Lake on the South Street. So he said, well, yeah, come on over, Jess. I had served with him in the General Assembly. So I knew him well, and he knew me. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, Speaker Madigan, do I create a problem in my desire to run for the Secretary of State? He says, yes, you do. I said, well, can you elaborate on that? He said, well, you know, all of the people who are running for the constitutional offices are from Cook County. We need someone from Southern Illinois or Central Illinois so we'll have a balanced ticket so we can gain support from those other parts of the, mm -hmm. of the state. Said, that makes a lot of sense. I said, who do you have in mind? He said, Penny Severance. I said, oh, that's, she's the senator from Decatur. Mm -hmm. And he said, Glenn Pichon? Oh, yeah, I know Glenn. Glenn is a former congressman from Southern mm -hmm. Illinois. He said, we're looking at those two. I said, okay, great. And then he said, there's a fellow by the name of Tim McCarthy. I said, who is Tim McCarthy? Mm -hmm. Tim McCarthy is a Secret Service agent who took a bullet for President Reagan. Mm -hmm. and. Um, as it turned out, he is thinking about running too. I don't know him, I don't trust him, and I think he's a Republican. I said, okay, mm -hmm. fine. So I went back to my organization, I explained to them the conversation mm -hmm. that I had with Speaker Madigan. And so they said, well, we're gonna circulate your petitions anyway. I said, well, you guys do what you wanna do. I'm enjoying <laughs> being the Cook County Recorder of Good Deeds. So about two months later, they called me and they said, uh, Mr. Recorder, we, uh, want you to see something. Well, they had two high stacks How many of petitions. times more than the required amount? Oh yeah, it, it, was, it was more, <laughs> it was way above. And then they had my petitions, and then they had Penny Severance's petition. They said, well, if you look at these petitions, mm -hmm. they won't carry the day. I said, why? Because they were round table. Mm -hmm. About 12 people sat around, they signed mm -hmm. the petitions. But over here, we have Tim McCarthy. I said, uh, let me see. He said, we want you to see who circulated Tim McCarthy's petitions. That's okay, fine. Ed Burke, mm -hmm. Tom Hines, mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Lipinski, mm -hmm. and Mike Madigan. So now I'm a little upset. Yeah, so that's I, right. So I called Mike and mm -hmm. Told me I'd like to speak with him. About the guy he didn't know. I did tell him <laughs> that, but that's what I want to speak with. Yeah. So I said, the last time I met with you, Mr. Speaker, I said, you told me that you didn't know McCarthy, didn't trust him, you thought he was a Republican. But yet, you, Lipinski, Burke, Hines, and yourself circulated his petitions. He said, well, I want to be able to retain control of the House, and we want to gain control of the Senate, and we think that McCarthy will be a better choice than you. So if I were you, Jesse White, I wouldn't waste my time and tell my friends not to waste their time, their money, or their efforts on your behalf because Tim McCarthy's going to become the next Secretary of State for the State of Illinois. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So now, I said, with all due respect to you, sir, I came to this meeting seeking a reason as to why I shouldn't run. You give me every reason as to why I'm going to run. You have a good day, sir. Ow! So I went back to my group and I said, gentlemen, I have a minute to win it. I have a minute to win it. So I averaged between 14 to 16 events mm. every day, mm. traveling all over the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. telling my story, telling about some of the things I would do within the Office of the Secretary of State. 
to restore some integrity to it, put it in a posture by which the people could be proud and provide them with the services that they richly need mm -hmm. and deserve. And as it turned out, I won the primary election, and the next day I met Speaker Madigan, visited with me, <laughs> and gave me a check for $10,000. <laughs> I said, Speaker, why are you giving me this check? It's all business. He said, yeah, he, yeah. he said you, you won the primary, and you're going to be involved with the general election, and your opponent's going to be a fellow by the name of Al Salvi, the former senator. I said, okay, fine, thank you very much. And we hugged each other, mm -hmm. shook hands, and we became friends again. <laughs> but I understood where he was coming from. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we have the greatest amount of respect for one another. We get along mm -hmm. well, in spite of it all. <laughs> that is so great. And I love as that it story. has turned out, we've been able to win on six occasions, the longest mm -hmm. serving and received more votes and served longer than anyone. That you are the highest vote getter of any politician, of any elected official in the history of the state of Illinois. How does it make you feel to know that, do you know, I mean, I have been in the back room, in the war room. I was deputy campaign manager for Governor Quinn in 2010 when he won. I remember when you walked through that door, I will never forget it. I'll never forget when you walked through the door at the end of the night. And I tell you, I've been in that room. I know what it's like when you're on pins and needles wondering what's going to happen, sure. what's going to happen. You know, as Secretary of State, you see so many candidates coming through. This, when you announced, I think, three years ago that you were going to retire, and the field for your position just became wide open. Everybody wanted to become Secretary of State. And you endorsed a young woman who I didn't know. Um, but I, in the back of my mind, I still always said, I, I, he's going to take care of business. I always feel it's kind of like what, what, what Madigan did. And in, 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 uh, in politics, there's what we say out here, and then there's what we do behind closed doors, because you have to... But, but whenever I say something, you take it to the bank. You take it to the I, bank? I don't, I don't play, you don't play those games. the backroom game. Okay. I, I, but I always want my word to be good. If yeah. I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I'm going to be someplace, uh -huh. I'm going to be there, I'm going to be on time. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a lot of my people, a lot of my colleagues, and a lot of people who work for me always say he's always ahead of time. <laughs> he's on time, always ahead of time. <laughs> Never late. Never late. I like that. I like that. That's military training. There again, there's that military training. Um, and so it's a courtesy, two, too. It is a courtesy. There are two things I think about when I think about um, things that could make a difference in our society. One is I think, and I'm, you can give your opinion about it, but I think we need to bring prayer back to school. And the other thing is I've considered what they do in Israel, which is two years of military service for every um, high school student, or I think when they graduate, they've got to go do two years of military, and I think it's even before they go to college. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you say Israel. Uh, we took the Thomas there. Uh, a beautiful country. I love it. Beautiful people. There was only one thing I didn't like about it. What's that? When they came to have me breakfast, no bacon, <laughs> egg, or sausage. That's right. <laughs> and they separate the other, dairy from Other than that, it was beautiful. <laughs> we performed before the military. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a, st when they found out I was, had served in the military, they gave me a standing ovation. The people there were just simply wonderful. Yeah. They were just some of the nicest people who mm -hmm. ever meet in life. Mm -hmm. And I'll always remember my experience with them. Uh, when it comes to, your question was. Yeah, so just about whether or not we could, whether you think we should consider two years of military service. I, I uh, think it would make our, our society a better place for all of us mm -hmm. to live because mm -hmm. they, we taught a lot of things that you normally would not be taught now because I doubt how these kids are involved with what's called SWU. What's SWU? Sidewalk University. Uh, oh, I have never heard that before, but I promise I'm borrowing it. <laughs> Sidewalk University, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's where they get They're the education. They're not learning the discipline, not the kind of discipline that matters. And not reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah. And you got to have those things. Sure. You just have to. Well, I just think that uh, we should make sure that, mm -hmm. like I do with my kids in my program, yeah. 
they have to be in school on time every day and have one aim in mind that is to get the best education possible. Mm -hmm. They have to be leafless, smokeless, and pipeless. The only time they can practice pharmacy <laughs> is after they've earned a white coat. And the easiest thing they'll do, <laughs> they can do in life, is to say, I can't or I quit. Mm -hmm. That will not fare very well with me. How many pairs of jeans do you own? Jeans? I don't think I've ever seen you in a pair of jeans. I, do, I, don't, I don't wear jeans. I used to. Why? I don't know. That's interesting. My father, I don't. I think he might have one pair that I've ever seen him in. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's that breed I keep talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, I, I, I wear just, you know, just these kind of mm -hmm. pants, and I fish a lot whenever mm -hmm. I get a chance. Mm -hmm. I but grew there's up a fishing. difference between black fishermen and white fishermen. You know the story? No. See, I fish a lot with white guys. Mm -hmm. They fish for the sport. Black man fishes to eat. <laughs> the white fisherman will release the fish back into the stream. Mm. The black fish will release it into the grease. <laughs> 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 so I teach some of my friends that. that. Yeah. And then with this phone I have. Oh yeah, the phone. I told you about this phone, did I not? I love this flip phone. I tell you about the time that I was coming out of the Joe Food store no. and a guy put a gun on me and told me it's a stick up. What? He says, I want your ring, your watch, your cash, your jewelry, anything of value. I went on the hood of this car, and if by chance I find out that you would sell something of value for me, I'm going to shoot you. I said, well, what about this? He said, oh, man, you can keep that. <laughs> More of the story is if Hillary Clinton had a phone like this, she'd be president today. <laughs> That's right. You know, they say the flip phone is the most secure phone around. Well, when I'm, we're up in Canada. And they can't reach Chicago. Mm -hmm. They say, "Well, Jess, can we use your flip phone?" Really? <laughs> oh yeah. I'm going back to Verizon to get and, my flip phone. And then in the Thompson Center, when you're down in the basement, you cannot mm -hmm. gain access to any of the floors above. But you they can. They say, "Hey, well, let me use your flip." Wow, that is really amazing. But I have 4,000 employees. That's the largest office of its kind in the United States. Mm -hmm. At the $396 million budget, 130 offices, 23 agencies, corporate files, securities, mm -hmm. keeping seal, quarter claims, libraries, the list goes on and on. I give them the sophisticated equipment. Mm -hmm. Flip phone. <laughs> Next of kin. Let me ask you a question. Um, when I think about, now I know that you're a man who really, and you've been very true to this, you're a man who doesn't see color when it comes to good people and, and goodness and, and um, you know, trying to get things done. Because you're either going to do it or you're not, and people who aid you, God sends people in all shades. It doesn't sure. matter. But at the same time, this is Chicago. Chicago is still a very polarized city when it comes to race relations and politics and many other things. What would you say is the state of black leadership in the city of Chicago. Now, Mayor Daley, Richard, would say sometimes that among some black leadership, they're fighting for crumbs more than sticking together to get things accomplished for the entirety of the black community. What say ye? I'm concerned about if you represent a district or an edge area or region, you should be concerned about what you can do to be the safety net, the light and the tone, the bright star for all the people you represent. I, I don't see color anymore. Mm -hmm. I graduated from Alabama State College and while I was there I got a chance to see segregation and discrimination at its worst. Mm. And I indicated then that I will never ever embark upon dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color, and with my organization and with my office, zero tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. Ethnic slurs, mm -hmm. unacceptable. You take on a job, you take on the responsibility that goes with it, mm -hmm. and that's how I run my my life. That's mm -hmm. how I run the office, and I, I've traveled all over the state of Illinois. I've gone down to some of those areas where probably you cannot let. Uh, the, the sun uh, fall on you, <laughs> or not fall <laughs> on you, right. but, but yeah, would, yeah. would let the sun go down on you. Not the sun, yeah, the mm -hmm. sun go down on you. And so, 
I've been there, done that, know that. I know how bad it makes you feel. I know how deeply it cuts. Zero tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. I just think, see, that if you, you take on a job, you take on the responsibility that goes with it. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite dance? Well, I do a, a lot of stuff. I, I, I do I, I do Tadikin with the bamboo poles, the oh, Filipino. Really? I also cha cha a little bit. Oh, look at you! Little, little, you do a little cha cha? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> what's your favorite genre of music? Oh, no rapper scratching the custard. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can have it all. All right. Bach, Beethoven, Bob, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you name it, Nancy Wilson, you know. That's right. Frank Sinatra, the list goes on and on. Wonderful. You know, they just, uh, the Niederlander Company just renamed a theater in New York after Lena Horne. It's the first theater in New York to Wonderful. be na named after a black woman. Nat King Cole's one of my favorite singers. And yeah. And Frank Sinatra. Yeah, we grew up listening to both of them. Well, as they say in the neighborhood, the both of them. The both of them. That's right, the both of them. <laughs> you know, Chicago is a beautiful city. The history of Chicago it. is phenomenal. We have been through a lot, obviously. But when you think about all the struggles this city has overcome, it takes exactly what you talked about earlier, and that's people coming together regardless of race, color, creed, ethnicity, etc. The best things come out of those kinds of, you know, collaborations. What is it going to take to get out of this? We're, we, we're becoming so divisive. It's like we were, I thought we were on a path to being bipartisan and collaborative, but we seem to be pulling apart. Well. It's a known fact that when we work together and live together in peace and harmony, wonderful things happen. Yes. That. And uh, I just, and our young people with these guns mm. uh, and drive-by shootings. Yes. Stealing cars. Stealing cars. And not going to school, being disrespectful. When I was a kid coming up, but right on the bus, you see the old lady or the young lady, mm -hmm. female, standing up. Some young lady, mm -hmm. you give the young lady your seat. I don't see that anymore. No. Or then, if you see the lady struggling with her groceries, you say, hey, "Ma'am, let me yeah. help you with your groceries." You don't see that anymore. Mm -mm. And then, kids in school with their hats on. Yeah, I taught school for many, many years. 33 years, zero tolerance when you come to into the classroom with your hat on. And then doing those things in society that are not in good keeping with the way in which we should live mm -hmm. and the examples that we should set. We have to set a good example for our young people and we want these young people to adhere to what we do mm -hmm. and what we say. There are times when we say something, but yet we do something else. That's right. The example is what's what we need to set, and people need to see that. Sure. Absolutely. You've set yourself apart from so many in so many ways, and I applaud you for it. I just can't tell you enough how proud I am of you and the work that you have done all of your career. What advice would you give to a young person, man, man or woman, who... Um, wants to do what you've done? Well, first of all, we want you to have a good heart. We want you to be concerned about everything around you and do something about those things that need to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And then take part in the political arena. Make sure that you come out and discharge your civil responsibilities. You vote, you're a taxpayer. You mm -hmm. get involved with the political community. You get involved with what's happening within the schools, what's happening within the libraries. Do all those things and more. Are you going to make your community a better place in which to live? And then set a good example with your young people. Mm. You say one thing, but you act a different way. Mm -hmm. No. The way, what you say, you have to back it up with action. Mm -hmm. You tell the kid, I don't want you smoking, and yet you out smoking. Mm -hmm. They say, well, I started this happening a long time. You got to break yeah, it. Yeah, you got to break it. Because you got this young man, this young lady, who you're bringing up, and you want them to have a long and productive life, and that's not going to occur if you are doing something that you should not be doing. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about um, direct democracy? Um, you know, we live in a, um, in a society where we have our elections, 
and our elected officials make all of our decisions for us. I'm of the mind that because we can, I believe we can no longer count on uh, people following a certain path when it comes to um, uh, making laws and creating policy, that we the people have a right to engage in um, policy making through initiatives or direct democracy. I'm a supporter of that, a strong supporter. I call myself a, um, I'm one of those super petition passers. There are people who would never get in the street with petitions and clipboards. I'm very good at it. I pride myself on it. And when it comes to things that I feel impact us, um, I feel compelled to do it. What are your thoughts about it? I, I, I like our the system that we have in place whereby we, you go out in society and you talk about your agenda. You talk about what you're going to do once you are elected or once you are put in place. If you violate that code or that commitment or those commitments, mm -hmm. then of course you become what is called persona non grata. <laughs> and so someone said, well, what does that mean? You're out of here. You're out of here. <laughs> next time the next election comes around, mm -hmm. we're going to make sure that this is what you said you were going to do, you didn't do it, or these are the things you said you were going to do, and you were going to help improve our quality of life. That has not occurred. Mm -hmm. So we have to, next, yeah, get yeah. out of here. Yeah. Next man, come on up. We've started doing that with judges, and I think we do need to do a better job of that with other elected officials. Sure. Who are you supporting for mayor for the city of Chicago? I, I, Walter Burnett is my alderman. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, but I, I do him a favor. I said, well, what is it? He said, I, I, I like Lori Lightfoot. Can you help me with that? I said, okay, fine. And so I'm, I'm with her right now. But mm -hmm. there, we just want to make sure that mm -hmm. the city is run a lot better than it's being run today. And I think that maybe that may send a message mm -hmm. to the next person that if they don't do what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. Then I'm going to remember you next time around. What do you think? And about I'm going to do a little bit more. Just remember you. <laughs> I'm going to formulate a posse to make sure that that, that uh, mm -hmm. say many hands makes heavy work light. That's right. We have a lot of people out there working against you. I want to be on that team. Yeah. What are your thoughts about term limits? No. An election is the term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every term is time for you to to, to run. Mm -hmm. If that term. Comes, that comes mm -hmm. around. But we have less and less people participating in the democracy. Well, I know that. I know that. Yeah. I'm, I'm really disappointed. Well, COVID and a lot of things, mm -hmm. and people have become disenchanted with the political arena as yeah. well. But they have to, we have to get them back into the fold. We got to get them back to participate in the political process. If you don't like someone, you vote for the other guy. Mm -hmm. But you cannot stay at home. How important is the church in the process? I think of Walter Burnett. Oh. Walter Burnett went to Moody. I went to Moody. I used to see him cross I love, campus. I love Moody Bible. Matter of yes. fact, we used to My former pastor, Bishop Brazier, went to Moody. I love Bishop. Matter of fact, I was with the son the other day mm -hmm. at Apostolic Church. Yes. I think that uh, the church is playing an important role. Matter of fact, whenever anyone is running for office, they want to visit the church because that's where you have a collection of uh, bodies. Mm -hmm. People who are well-educated, well-informed, and uh, by you coming there, introducing yourself, and speaking a little about what you want to do, mm -hmm. they can feel your pulse, they can almost feel your heart, <laughs> and uh, they will leave either with two thumbs up or, or a thumb th down. <laughs> That's right. And Bishop taught us well. Bishop was my father in many ways. Well, the minister will lead the flock, and he will tell you. Uh, he give you the yeah. nod or the. <laughs> when Bishop were, uh, retired as a Sunday school teacher, he, um, I think the greatest gift he ever gave me was he turned his class over to me. And I taught adult Bible study for 20 years at Apostolic Church of God. Right. Juliana Stratton. Yes. Uh, I used to take her to the churches. Mm -hmm. So we were. She we was, sat she, in she, she, in she the was competing against a fellow by the name of Ken Duncan, who was from my organization, who had decided he wanted to be, support the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So she said, uh, What should I say when I'm in church? I said, Well, you just tell them 
about the fact that you were you're a Sunday school teacher. Mm-hmm. And well, she said, well, what about Ken Duncan? I said, you let, let me take care of that part. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me give the fact, let me lay out the facts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she won. She did, and she's winning it. She just won again. And, and I always take her out, out to the churches. That's and J. right. J.B. Pritzker, that's a mm-hmm. good guy. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. She's wonderful. I just saw her a couple of weeks ago. We were uh, the new the new president of Spelman College. Uh-huh. Uh, we had a, um, a farewell party for her, and yeah. uh, Juliana was there. But J. B. Pritzker, uh, he and his family are just some of the most beautiful people I've ever met. In life. I've met him in M. K. And you've known him a long time. I have. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, when I was teaching at the Shell Elementary School, mm-hmm. I was in the gym, and I received a call from Cindy Pritzker. Mm-hmm. They had a JB, mm-hmm. and they invited us out to the we just say hi to here, and we uh, brought sixty kids. They said, "Well, how mm-hmm. many can you bring?" I th- I said, I said, "We're short of kids." I said, "Well, uh, how many do you need?" She says, uh, "We need a we got between fifty and sixty slots available." Mm-hmm. I said, "I hope you would not refer to me as being greedy." If I'd say, "I'll take all 60. They said, "No, you can give me sixty kids." I said, "Sure." <laughs> So I took these 60 kids out to mm-hmm. let me see how had over here. We got off the elevator and we looked in this one banquet hall. People on stilts, jugglers, mm. card tricks, the whole nine yards. <laughs> Dog and pony show big time. Uh-huh. And then we went to the next room. All the food or anything that you could fantasize in terms of liquid and gastronomical oh. appeasement was made available. <laughs> Then we went to the next ballroom at toys, oh, jackets, wow. coats, high end, mm-hmm. like in the mm-hmm. movie with John Wick, high yes. table. This yes. is high table. <laughs> so they did that for many, many years. Even now, really? they make sure they have coats for the kids. That's beautiful. And You're about to have a coat drive. We're going to have a coat drive here, yes, at mm-hmm. the Jesse White Community Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also do something else. Every summer, we give out to about 800 college students, the school supplies. Oh. I tell the parents, it's a trunk mm-hmm. of school supplies. I said to the parents, we will take care of the school supplies, you take care of the scholarship. Oh, now that's a deal right there. Okay. That's a good deal right there. And so there. we've been doing that for quite a while. Mm-hmm. But with the Jesse White Tumblers, I've been doing that for 64 years. Tell me about the Jesse White Tumblers. How did you start this organization? Well, as I said, a German It fellow, was those push-ups. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I was doing that before then. But a fellow by the name of Vince Schoenfeld, a German fellow at Seward Park, taught mm-hmm. me gymnastics. And then I, when I was in college, I was physical education major. When mm-hmm. I come home during the summer, George Dunn, my Irish godfather, would mm-hmm. make sure I had a job with the park district. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was asked to pull in the gym show at Rockwell Guards on the west side. And at one gym show, came the Jesse White Tumbler team. The parents said, um, uh, I heard you go- you're not going to do any more tumbling with the kids. I said, well, no, I was asked to pull in at one gym show, and, and that's it. Mm-hmm. They said, no, these kids love coming to the park. They love being with you, and you've turned changed, turned their lives mm-hmm. around, and you've inspired them to want to be in school on time every day. Mm-hmm. They want to put some between theirs every day, scalp us knowledge. <laughs> I said, well, that's what I've <coughs> tried to teach them. They mm-hmm. said, well, they, they know it to a team. And so I said, okay, I'll try one more year, and one more year, and here I am, 64 years later. That's amazing. I think about the um, Chicago West Community Music Center, where Howard and Darlene Sandifer are the co-founders and executive directors. I was interviewing Mark Ruffin, who has the jazz station on Sirius XM, um, and Mark was, was, was reminiscing about 25 years ago he remembered a conversation he had with Howard Sandifer. Uh-huh. And at that time, Howard was giving him the vision that he had for this conservatory without walls for inner city kids to teach them music and teach them how to play instruments and how, teach them the business of music. And here today, 20 years later, the Chicago West Community Music Center is thriving. I'm on the board, a proud board member. And just before COVID, we had a thriving exchange program with Shanghai, China, a Pudang Youth Center that we would send our kids to. They wrote their first song on the streets of Paris Wonderful. on an exchange program. Wonderful. So those kinds of things that are, you know, when we make those kinds of things available for the youth, it is life 
changing. We have to do all we can to help these young people to grow tall and straight. Yes. And give them the tools that they need in order to bring that about. And make sure that they understand that we're counting on them to be the best they could be. Mm. And the only time we want them to look down is life is to tie their shoes. Mm. But they also have to be leafless, smokeless, and pipeless. <laughs> <laughs> now you said her. <laughs> The only time they can find the pharmacies <laughs> after they've earned a white coat. After they've earned a white coat, that's right, that's right. And they just keep, that keeps replaying over. Oh, yeah, it's the greatest reminder. Sometimes they think that that's their savior. They sell it or they smoke it and put it in their life. Oh my goodness. One of the stories you told earlier included you saying, well, you know, in Chicago, we don't turn the other cheek. Well, that was when Dr. I, Dr. King. Well, when I think about your career, and all that you have had to do, there is, and you, you have had to turn the cheek so many times to be able to be as successful as you are in all the things that you've done. How do you maintain your courage, your dignity, your hope, and your sheer tenacity and will for moving forward when you're constantly well, not attacking back. Well, when someone says to me that I cannot achieve, or when they say to me that I cannot do something, mm -hmm. like they told me, you don't have the intestinal fortitude to, to jump out of airplanes. Well, 35 jumps later. Mm. They told me I couldn't play professional baseball. Mm. Eight years of professional baseball. Mm -hmm. They said I would not become a state rep. In a district that was, and that's in this area, 85% mm -hmm. white, 10% mm -hmm. black, 5% others, and I served for 16 years. Wow, wow. And they told me I could not become the Secretary of State. Mm. I could not become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Whenever someone would tell me that I could not achieve, it inspired me to dig within. Mm. And I tell my young people, when you dig within, you'll be amazed at what you'll be able to come up with. That's right. A winner never quits and the quitter never wins. That's right. And nobody can steal your blessings because what right. God's got for you is yours. That's right. Jesse White, this has been a fantastic conversation. I have enjoyed this thoroughly. Well, Doris, you've been a breath of fresh air, too. Thank you for joining the Black Muse podcast. Glad to be on board. <laughs> and if you want me to be on board in the near future, it's simple. Invite me. I certainly will do that. You can count on it. Thank you. And there we are, Jesse White, Secretary of State with the Black Muse Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us.